Hello and welcome to On The Move, a show about what's going on in Hampton Roads featuring community leaders who are moving the region forward. I'm Thomas Becker with Hampton Roads Transit and today we're talking tunnels, certainly one of the region's hottest topics. Joining us is uh, Ryan Bennis, he's the Associate Vice President of HNTB Corporation and the Project Director of the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel Expansion, the largest highway construction project in Virginia's history. He works daily with VDOT to ensure the project remains on track. Welcome, Ryan. Well, thank you very much for having me. This transformative project will widen the current four-lane segments along nearly 10 miles of I-64 between Settlers Landing Road in Hampton and I-564 in Norfolk. Two twin-lane tunnels are under construction to accommodate four lanes of traffic each way for an eventual total of eight lanes of capacity across the James River. The project's total budget is over $3.9 billion, making it one of the largest infrastructure projects in the country. Ryan, that's an impressive project to, to be in charge of. Um, give us a, a brief update on where we stand on the construction. Yeah, absolutely. So I always like to think of the project like I'm driving back on my old commute from Northern Virginia back to Hampton Roads, my home in Norfolk. Uh, so starting up on the peninsula, Mallory Street Interchange, we're really excited there with the widening that's ongoing right now. Uh, if we continue with the progress we've seen, we'll be switching traffic over onto the new half of the Mallory mm -hmm. Street Bridge here uh, later this summer, which will be a really significant improvement for pedestrians in the area, giving them better access to the VA and Hampton University. As we leave the, the north side or the peninsula and head south side, we've all been driving on our new mm -hmm. uh, our new north trestle there across the uh, harbor. The first higher, it's a nice view. Higher, a little yeah. bit higher, but I think the most important thing, and one of the things I always like to think about is the history that we're making at the project. Uh, and I kind of put it in the perspective for our staff that we put the first bridge across the river at the HRBT in more than 50 years. Yeah. So when you think the existing structures handled more than 800 million vehicles in their lifespan, and they were only there for about 50 years, Years, our structures are designed to be there for over a hundred. So if you really think about how many vehicles, how many people are going to benefit from that construction, it's truly amazing to think about that. So billions of people will get to use those before their, their service life is up. But then we jump into North Island, uh, exciting part for us. That's where Mary currently sits. She's poking her head through. If you've seen some of the great videos we the have. The boring machine, right? Yeah, yeah, Mary, our boring machine. She's just poked her head out. So we've had the opportunity to do some maintenance now that she's done with that first tunnel. Uh, we are in the early stages of bringing her out of the ground and rotating her because as you mentioned, we have to do two tunnels right. across the harbor. So she's done that first one. We'll be bringing her out, rotating her, um, using some really cutting edge technology. And the way I can best describe it is we are gonna put her on one of the world largest Lazy Susans. So we will bring her out in pieces, spin her in 180 degrees, reassemble her, and then put her on her way back over there to the South Island, back towards Norfolk. So how did that first trip go? How did she do the, the first time around? Yeah, the first time around, you know, the, the really crazy thing about this that my boss at VDOT constantly reminds me of is that we have put more men on the moon than we have built tunnels using this technology. Uh, so the fact that we were able to accomplish this feat in a little under 51 weeks is absolutely amazing. So that first trip, 51 weeks, uh, went pretty well. Uh, when you really look at standing up a 430 foot machine, you know, 10 million pounds, I mean, Mary is a massive piece of equipment. And just like any custom built machine or ship, we have a lot of those here in Hampton Roads, um, you go through startup and testing and commissioning, and you've got to really kind of learn how the machine likes to operate. So, you know, after 51 weeks, we know Mary very intimately, and we saw actually towards the end of her drive, uh, where you think things would have gotten a little bit more tricky heading uphill into uh, natural formations, Mary hit her stride and did her absolute best. Wow. So that time in the ground, that time working alongside her every day, our crews really figured out all of her intricacies and we're really pushing hard there at the end, and it was a great first journey. Happy to do it again here in the coming months. And and it goes underneath some very historic shipping lanes, right? Yes. So that, what was some of the interesting uh, things that came out of out of the the bottom of the of the of the river? Yeah. So you know during our construction, we've had multiple things that we've actually had the opportunity to find during our construction. Uh, first and foremost, at North Island over on the Hampton side, when we were getting ready to expand that island out 15 acres to be able to receive Mary uh, during our excavation, we mm -hmm. found timber and granite 
dating back to 1819. Uh, working with William & Mary, great partnership we have with them and the Department of Historical Resources. We are able to source and understand that that came from a barge that was wrecked during a storm back in 1819. Uh, and we have those artifacts now. We're actually looking for great uses. So if you have okay. any good use okay. in HRT, please let us know. We're happy to share our finds. Uh, in addition to that, I will say uh, the two other cool things that I think we found, uh, cannonballs, Civil War era cannonballs. So we have Fort Wool there to the, to the ocean side of where we are. And we actually, to create the South Island back in the 70s, they took material from around Fort Wool and then deposited it back to make our island. So in doing so, we found several Civil War era cannonballs, uh, actually nine. Um, and another great story, great partnership we have with the folks up at Langley. Uh, they came down, their explosive ordnance disposal unit came down and hmm. safely uh, <laughs> looked at those, took care of a few of them, detonated a couple, uh, but we still retain five of those to date. But I will say the coolest thing we found, uh, and I say this, I have a four-year-old son at home, and I've got him very much on the path of tunnel boring machines are cool. Um, <laughs> I thought that was enough, but when I told him that we found dinosaur bones, yeah. I became really cool in the eyes of a four-year-old. Yeah. So uh, maybe not a dinosaur, but prehistoric find. So uh, we found uh, back in the fall of 2023, mastodon remains that date anywhere between 12,000 and 50,000 years old um, that uh, were very likely, uh, it was a mastodon that wandered into a freshwater mud pit, mm -hmm. uh, was overcome and here some 12,000 to 50,000 years later, our tunnel boring machine picked them up, found wow. them, and we have them in our possession and something that's a pretty cool uh, party trick to break out when we have guests come to the project <laughs> and show like, hey, look how cool this is. The so, museum pieces for sure. Absolutely, you know, we've had a great, another great partnership with the Virginia Museum of Natural History. They helped us identify those remains, restore those remains, they're in our possession now. We're going to be using them in our welcome center that will be opening okay. up later this summer. Um, but they're really just a great opportunity. You know, I've been in Hampton Roads for 13 years, you don't really think about finding remains of animals from 10, 12, 50,000 years ago. So really helps us understand where those things are. We get to deep dive a little bit into prehistoric ages of how these things lived, where they roamed, where the iceberg, or I'm sorry, the, the glaciers, glaciers were all in play. And it's a, it's a really interesting um, an enjoyable part of, of our job. You know, things they don't teach you in engineering school, right, right, you pick right. up on the way. And you mentioned the tunnel is set up for the reverse course. When does that begin? Yeah, so if everything keeps going to plan, Mary will be back in the ground early fall. We're aiming for September, October timeframe. Okay. She'll break into the ground, and the first few hundred feet are a little bit slow for us as we get her positioned correctly, get her trailing gear behind her. So we kind of think of Mary, the cutter head, uh, as, the, as the engine of a train, and her gantries behind her, the train car. So it takes us a little bit of time to get those configured. Uh, but here towards the end of the year, break into early 2025, she will be well underway making her way back towards South Island with a hopeful eventual breakthrough there of summer next year. So hopefully by this time next year, okay. we're celebrating her breakthrough. We're darn near it. We're waiting it very close. I can't wait for that. I mean, honestly, it is, it's fascinating to see and um, a, a tribute to technology and engineering for sure. You mentioned in the beginning, it's more than just the tunnel. Uh, walk us through kind of the, the roadway and existing bridge work. Yeah. So we are, um, you know, when we talk about the HRBT, tunnels in our namesake, mm -hmm. but we are more than six, or 70, 65 percent a roadway project. Mm -hmm. And that really takes those north trestles that we talked about between North Island and Hampton. But there's also a large expanse of land from South Island all the way down to Patrol Road. So we have those long trestles that lead from the spit out to the island. We have the mile long Willoughby Bay bridges, really big bridges there. But then we have all the improvements that make its way down there next to the Navy, next to the Ocean View neighborhood. Right. So that work, we're, we're currently underway. More than 20 bridges within that area that we're going to rehabilitate, widen, or reconstruct as a part of this effort. Lead abatement, bearing replacements, widening those structures, being very mindful to stay within our own right of way. That's another thing we're really cognizant of. And as you can imagine, I know at HRT, you deal with the same challenges we yeah. do. We have to be really mindful of resiliency. So that means taking care of the storm water that already exists, but also when we put down these impervial surfaces, we have to give that new water that we've created, that new volume that can't seep into the ground, a place to go. So stormwater facilities, ensuring that we have proper drainage along the way, all those improvements are such a massive, massive part and often underlooked part of our project. A, a lot to think about when you're you know, slowing down for the cones and the workers, what goes into that, right? Absolutely. And it's a staggeringly, to me, complex process. What is the ultimate uh, end, end game uh, or date you yeah. know, for completion? So where we're currently tracking right now, our contractor has a substantial completion date, which means you will be able to use the facility free and clear 
by the spring of 2027. So February okay. 2027, all capacity should be opened. However, and we're hoping that they, they take us up on this offer, our contractor is incentivized to finish earlier. So they have a bonus that they can achieve if they finish in the fall of 2026 in September. So we're really hoping that they go and take us up on that offer and open this capacity even sooner because it will be so transformational for our entire region once the HRBT is completely expanded. And let's build on that because I don't mean to be flip or, or, or ask an obvious question, but why is this needed? Well, you know, when the project or when the facility was originally designed back in the 50s and then expanded in the 70s, we were expecting to be able to handle about 60,000 cars a day. Mm -hmm. We're regularly doing upwards of 100,000 vehicles a day. So that is a heck of a lot more than we ever anticipated that would run through this corridor. Now we know that funding has always been a challenge in, in our region here. You know, we're the seven cities, the, the multiple municipalities that make up Hampton Roads is one of our strengths. But we've also always had to compete for those in the past. Right. And, through the creation of HR TAC, it allowed us to provide funding for this project that was raised regionally, managed by our local elected officials, and give us 92% of the funding okay. that was not only needed, but necessary to expand this. So right now, what we're really redoing, what we're doing is creating the, the capacity that we've always needed, that we've needed since the 90s when, this, when the first right. study was originally enacted to understand what the next crossing needed to be at the HRBT. So in overcoming that lack of capacity, we are really going to unlock, I think, all the great things that exist, not only here on the south side and on the peninsula, but really more parts of the upper and western peninsula as you move toward yeah. Richmond. People yeah. who live up in West Point, that couldn't commute all the way down here because it was too prohibitive because of traffic will now have well, that opportunity. <clears throat> right, traffic, psychology, all that matters. And so uh, to build on that, what are some of the uh, sort of expected economic benefits? Well, at the end of the day, a few things that we're really excited just during construction of the project. Uh, you know, for our project at $3.9 billion, Virginia's largest, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, we have a massive DBE and small business program. In fact, more than $550 million of small business contracts have already been signed. 80% of those businesses are Virginia residents, which mm -hmm. that's huge. So that impact is absolutely massive. On top of that, the economic benefit is going to be you know, improved capacity, reliable travel times, and that's really going to unlock the ability of folks that want to live in more rural communities to commute into our region, work at the shipyard, be an active duty right. um, service member that has to come down to Naval Station Norfolk, go down to the Norfolk Navy Yard, wherever it may be. So those impacts, you know, I've had the, the, uh, the privilege in my career of opening many new facilities. I will tell you without a doubt, no facility I have ever opened or probably ever will open in my future projects will be as impactful as what HRBT will be when it opens. And that's an impressive um, observation, right? So right now, uh, worker-wise, all the small businesses involved, all the construction workers, what are we talking about? So right now we're looking at a daily footprint or a daily headcount of about 1,300 individuals working on the project. Now that doesn't include all of the vendors, other folks that are delivering material to the project or that are helping stock those in warehouses that are bringing material either from the port, bringing it down from Richmond or other parts of the country. You know, we have precast facilities down in Chesapeake, North Carolina, up on the Eastern shore. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the folks that are working directly on our footprint, one of those 1300 heads, there are even more folks than that that are elsewhere in the region, elsewhere in the country that are helping support our project. Uh, here on On The Move, we love talking transit, so I wanted to ask you a question about that. You know, we operate the 757 express routes that connect the peninsula with Southside. Tell us about plans for the high occupancy lanes and how bus riders will benefit. Yeah, so bus riders will benefit, I would say, almost as much, if not more, than anyone. Because now, when you get on that bus and we have this HOT capacity, you are going to have a guaranteed level of service across the harbor. So how that works, because we were converting existing HOV lanes that the federal government helped us build years ago into hot lanes, which means single riders can now use them. One of the stipulations is we have to maintain a very specific speed or level of service across that corridor, and that speed is 45 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So by creating this capacity, and as a bus rider, you're there with more than just one of your friends, right. you will get to use that capacity and you will be guaranteed a 45 mile an hour trip through our facility. So we, we as we discussed before coming on, on air, we have a very <laughs> symbiotic relationship. When we win, you win, and vice versa, right. this is only going to benefit those HOVs far and above anybody else because now they will have additional dedicated capacity to go across the harbor. Well, and it helps our schedule reliability too. So Absolutely. those getting to the workplace uh, can, can count on HRT even more. Absolutely. 
Um, we're heading into the busy summer travel season. Safety is always an issue. Uh, what do you want uh, motorists to know, particularly the summer season, uh, as they approach these zones? Well, you know, for local Hampton Roads residents, it's no secret that a lot of folks want to come down here in the summer. They want to enjoy the beach. They want to cool down a little bit. Maybe they're just heading down to the Outer Banks or going off to the ocean front. So first and foremost, I would say is always be alert. And, and remember, you're going to be driving alongside folks that don't drive this corridor every single day. So they won't know about some of the changes in traffic patterns, and they may not be quite as patient as you are because we experience it every day, whereas them, it's a new experience. And you're on vacation, right? You want to get to yeah. your destination yeah. quickly. So the big thing I always tell folks when they go across our corridor, uh, first and foremost, is remember you're driving through someone's office. Uh, you know, as a as a younger man, my very first week on on the on the job coming out of college, I was out measuring pavement markings in a lane closure, and I heard tires lock up behind me to turn around and see a vehicle about eight feet behind me that could have hit me. Mm -hmm. And at a very you know, it's probably great to have that experience because it was very sobering and to remind me that those hazards always exist. So as folks drive our corridor, always remember you're going through somebody's office. The other thing I will say, on top of being aware of those around you and that you're in somebody's office is to slow down and put down your phone. I can't tell you how many accidents we see that occur throughout the state, throughout the country, because folks are on their phone. We have that data now, yeah. the numbers don't lie. As much right. as we may wanna say that's not the truth, but really is we have that data. So put down your phone, focus on the road, and we'll say, pack your patience. It is gonna happen. We are very cognizant that we're having a momentary impact, but I promise you that the benefit is on the way. And that benefit will be here for generations to come. So when you bring your grandkids on those vacations you experience as a young adult, they won't sit in the same traffic you are today. You can use your phone on the buses, just not in the car. Right? That's true. <laughs> um, you have a lot out there in terms of the project. How can the public stay informed on the project, uh, developments, alerts, that sort of thing? Yeah. Well, I will say from alerts, I am the biggest advocate for the VDOT 511 app. I love Google Maps, I love Waze, but if I wanna know what traffic looks like at any current uh, intersection or camera along the interstate, pull up that 511 app, you get a 30 second live feed to every single camera in this Commonwealth's inventory. Mm -hmm. So that is a huge advantage. If you don't really trust Google or Waze, go look at that camera, you know where to go. On top of that, if you sign up for the HRBT Expansion Project newsletter, you can get our traffic alerts, you can get uh, media outreach. We have a presence on Twitter, or I'm sorry, X, <laughs> Facebook, Instagram. Uh, those are really active accounts somewhere we try to post very consistently to keep folks aware of what's going on in our project. We know that it might not always be the best news, but we wanna share that news with you as soon as we can so that you can adapt your travel uh, to arrive at the most reliable time you can and have those expectations met when you leave your house. Pack patience and plan ahead, right? Absolutely. Ryan, thank you for joining us. Oh, Appreciate it's absolutely it. been a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for joining us on this episode of On The Move. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you won't miss out. See you again soon.